This is the Mark Dolan Way. Top tips for mind, body and soul, some great life hacks and my favourite products of the week. This show is available on all podcast platforms or you can watch it. Just subscribe to the Mark Dolan Way on YouTube and join the Facebook group. Enjoy. Hello and welcome to the show. I hope you're very well. Here is a piece of advice that will give you the edge over 95% of the population. And it's a three word piece of advice. Stick with it. Whatever it is you've embarked upon, some kind of career, any project, perhaps it's learning the guitar or a language. Stick with it. Stay with it. Keep on trucking, baby because it's human nature to tune out of things, to do stuff for a little while and then lose faith, lose heart and cancel the project. All you've got to do to give yourself that opportunity of success that will push you streets ahead of everyone else is by just always doing it, by just turning up week in, week out and keeping that commitment and never giving up. Just keep on trucking. You keep on doing it. Now, Joe Rogan is the host of the most successful and listened to podcast in the world. I think it's something like 11 million downloads a week. Uh, What's his secret? Is it the best podcast out there? Probably not. Is he the best interviewer or the finest comedian? No, he's a very talented guy. But is he, you know, is he literally the best? No, what it is is that he stuck with his podcast. He started it many years ago, over 10 years ago. And all his friends said, why are you bothering this with this? You're not making any money. And you, um, it's a lot of work, a lot of efforts, and no one's listening. But he just somehow felt that it was a good thing to do. And he stuck with it. So predominantly, the success of that show was and is related to his tenacity, his decision to just keep doing it even though the rewards for years and years and years were non-existent. So whatever it is you want to do, just stick with it. Do not give up. Just keep on going because you never know the moment at which it could suddenly catch light and you will have amazing, fabulous success. Now, the point is that if you've embarked on something that you want to do, um, it, it, it's got to be from the heart. It's got to be an ambition of yours. So don't stick with something that you hate. So if you've got a job in an industry that you loathe and are seeking to escape, there's no point sticking with that. But if the end goal, so imagine if if it was um, that you had a business idea and you were going to create a new kind of smartwatch. Well, if you're persistent about it and, and if you're committed to the dream of having this brand new smartwatch, which is a different kind of technology. It's bringing something um, to the table, which the industry isn't aware of. You're innovating, you're breaking the rules. Then you just keep on going because you will get there in the end. And that's the point. And the truth is that even if you're not successful at the end, just that journey will be very rewarding and very satisfying because anybody that's pursuing something they want to do is normally very stimulated, very motivated. I think it's good for your mental and physical health to be doing things that have an end goal that is exciting to you, that is desirable to you, that you're pursuing something that you want. That's key to happiness. It's key to fulfillment. And actually the success bit, of course, that's what you want because you've got bills to pay. So the money will come in and all the rest of it. Uh, But the journey should be almost as good. And that's a great acid test. But do stick with it. And um, I'll kind of give you a slightly related quote from Winston Churchill. Now, Winston Churchill was talking here about human perseverance. But the great line from Churchill is, if you're going through hell, keep going. How about that? If you're going through hell, keep going. And that's something that we've all got to do in life, that as long as you are motivated by that end goal, then you just struggle through. It's like you're climbing up that mountain and there's blizzards and there's snow and there's avalanches, but you want to get to the top. So this is a nightmare. I'm wet. I'm cold. What is my solution? To keep putting one foot in front of the other 
until I get there. Never give up. Keep it going. Keep on trucking, baby. Something that's very good for your mental and physical health is singing. Not enough people sing. And that's because it's the domain of professional musicians. They get to sing every day. But what about you? Why aren't you singing? So something I do occasionally, especially if I've got the place to myself and my family are are, are out of the building, is I switch on the music system that I have in the kitchen. And I've got a small, a portable little amplifier with a microphone attached to it. The kind of thing that buskers use in the street. So I've got my music system and I've got the little amplifier and a microphone. And I go onto YouTube and I just choose any song I like and I just put the word karaoke in. Karaoke in. So as you might know, I'm a huge fan of Elton John. So if I decided I was going to sing, I guess that's why they call it the blues. You just put, I guess that's why they call it the blues karaoke into YouTube. And then you'll have probably several options of excellent karaoke songs. What will happen is you'll have the instrumental background music and you won't have Elton's vocal. So you're the one that's singing and the words will appear on the screen. It's free. It's YouTube. Back in the day, in the old days, when people used to organise parties, you'd have to pay a company to bring around this equipment and somebody would like run the karaoke night. It was very expensive, but you can just do it all yourself now. It's all on YouTube. Um, You don't need the microphone. You can just play the karaoke song on YouTube and you sing along. If you love the song, you probably won't have to read the words because you'll know them anyway. But if you're having a party, what you can do is you can get the iPad out or the computer and and it's going to be a nice big screen and everyone can see the words as they sing along. And normally the words slowly change colour as you're going through the lyrics. That's normally how they do it. But yeah, free karaoke on YouTube. Absolutely spectacular. Just give it a go. I often sing when I'm in a really good mood. So it's a sign that I'm quite happy. So as I say, I've got everyone out the house. I've, I've had lots of coffee. All is good with the world. And that's when I will fire up some tunes and I will just sing my heart out. And I like to do it when there's no one there because then I can just be as loud as I like and not self-conscious. But if you have trusted loved ones or friends who aren't going to tease you for singing, then um, then do it in front of them. And of course, it is amazing for a party. Why don't you have friends around and say we're having a karaoke party? Tell them to practice and rehearse a particular song. Let them let that be their party piece and they'll come along and they'll sing it and they'll blast it out. Madonna's like a virgin, whatever it is. But karaoke is so great and singing is so wonderful. And I just think that the solution of using YouTube for these karaoke songs, and by the way, every song you can think of has got a karaoke version on YouTube. Um, It's, uh, yeah, it's just a beautiful thing and it will make you feel good. And I'm convinced and I don't have the science to back this up, but I just think it's got to be good for your health to sing. It's got to make you happy and fulfilled and give you those positive hormones and a great outlook and a great frame of mind. I would sing to you now, but I think it's complicated with music rights. I don't want to get in trouble with Elton's people, but otherwise I would blast out one or two, but I'll I'll spare you the horror of that. But sing at home. If you don't have access to YouTube or you don't have the loudspeaker, you haven't got the music um, system, the music player, then just sing unaccompanied. Just choose a song you like and just sing it. You know, lots of people sing in the bath or sing in the shower. But as you're run, going about your errands, I mean, it's it's hard to justify singing in public. But if you're just because you'll get stared at, it's, it's an odd look, really, to walk down the street singing. But at home, even without music, you can you can just do it yourself. Choose your favorite song, maybe even print out the lyrics from the Internet and just give it a go. But yeah, let's get the world singing. Another great free thing, because I want there to be lots of great free things for you on this show, is as follows. Audiobooks. Now, audiobooks are good, aren't they? Because we're all very busy. Who's got time to sit around reading books? It's lovely if you can. On holiday is often a good opportunity or if you're traveling or when you go to bed. But I don't know about you, but I find that I'm so tired by the time I go to bed. I can manage a paragraph and then I fall asleep. So how do we up 
our book reading because we know it's good for us. It's escapist, it's relaxing, it's informative, it's entertaining. Reading is truly spectacular. Well, audiobooks. Now, the problem is that audiobooks are bloody expensive. So if there's a new book that's out, let's say it's the Harry Potter, the new Harry Potter or something, what's, what's that going to cost you? Seven, eight, nine pounds? That's a lot of money, right? That's how much the book costs. Well, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the audiobook will cost about the same, if not more. So audiobooks are expensive. Uh, what's the solution? Well, I'm delighted to say it's YouTube again, because there are so many classic books that have an audiobook version on YouTube. So let's imagine it's Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. Good, I had to think about that. You know, there's going to be a couple of versions of Great Expectations on YouTube and you listen for free. There will be thousands of books, audiobooks for free on on YouTube. Um, I really like the book The Road Less Travelled, which is a self-help book. I've mentioned it in a previous show. It's got an excellent first sentence, which is life is difficult. And those three words will help you hugely because essentially it acknowledges the fact that, yes, things are hard. And if you if you work on the basis that life is difficult, it's the starting point of life, that that is the foundation of life, is that it is difficult. Well, that's the key to happiness, because then when things are hard, you're like, well, I didn't do anything wrong. It's not my fault. It's because life is difficult. And when that is your mindset, then you find that when good things happen, it's very, very joyful because you're like, well, life is difficult. But then this amazing person has entered my life or I've got this amazing job or an unexpected cash windfall or some great news about my health. And then suddenly, you know, you've got wings and you're buzzing. And it's all because you've your basis of life is that it's hard. And then when it's not hard, that's a lovely thing. Well, that's a very good book, The Road Less Travelled. It's available for free on YouTube as an audiobook. Happy days saved you a fortune. So do do um, try, if you can, to introduce an audiobook in your life. I also love listening to podcasts, absolutely. But what's nice about an audiobook is that somebody has, someone's written a book, haven't they? So they've sat down, they've really thought about it. If you read Charles Dickens's Great Expectations, that's the product of months of work and thought and rewrites and edits blood, sweat, tears and perspiration. That's why books are so lovely is because they are considered. Podcasts are fine, you know, radio as well, freewheeling chat. But a book is a permanent piece of art that's been um, created by someone. And it, you know, it emanates from their life experience. It's their vision. It's their story. It's their filter. And that's very special. But as I say, who's got time to read actual books? I mean, if there is time to read books, lovely. But if not, and the thing about audiobooks is that you can be walking down the street and you can be on your way to the train station and you can catch another chapter or maybe sitting on the train or in your lunch hour. Audiobooks are lovely when you're just going for a walk. You want to just have a bracing walk. It's a tremendous way to pass the time. Now, there are lots of other things I want to talk to you about today. Focus on outcomes, not obstacles. So if you've embarked on any project, all you have to do is think about what the end product is, what you actually want to achieve. OK, and don't worry about the obstacles, OK, because they will always come along. And you must acknowledge and accept that there are setbacks. So let's say an athlete wants to be in the Olympics and they want to get gold for the 100 meters. Well, you know, there are days when they'll go training and they're going to like have a little bit of pain in their calf muscle and they'll pull the muscle or or maybe, um, you know, maybe they woke up and, and uh, they're feeling tired and it's raining outside and therefore I don't want to train today, but you still do it anyway. So you ignore the obstacles and focus on the outcome. That's absolutely game changing advice. It's just the end goal. I don't care what they throw at me as I pursue my dream because I'm focused on that finish line. And therefore, these trifling roadblocks and uh, obstacles are, are, you know, a mere irritation. I'm just going to swap them away like flies. I'm going to acknowledge that they're part of the process. They're part of the journey. But if something slows you down, if you get a setback, don't focus on that. 
So let's say, I don't know, you, you, you're pitching a business idea, you're seeking investment and you've had a meeting and a large group of investors have said, no, thanks, but no thanks. It's a terrible business idea. We will not be investing. Well, OK, that's an obstacle, but that's not the end point. OK, that is that's not related to the outcome. The outcome is that you're going to get your business off the ground and that's a setback and it's just part of the story and it will all be the sweeter when you eventually prevail. Don't forget that J.K. Rowling was turned down by scores of publishers before Harry Potter was finally accepted by Bloomsbury and published, which enriched that rather small publishing company to the tune of millions. But, you know, what did uh, what did J.K. Rowling do? She wrote the books. OK, her focus, the outcome was to to get these things written and then get them published. And she got knockbacks, but she didn't kind of think, all right, well, the three or four publishers have said, no, clearly the books are rubbish and therefore I will just give it up and go and get a regular job. She didn't do that. She focused on the outcome. She wouldn't take no for an answer. She she kept it going. She stuck with it. And essentially, I suppose her view would have been that until my dying death, I will seek to get these books published. And it's that tenacity, it's that unwillingness to walk away and to be that dogged and bloody minded about it that will see you succeed and remember what i was saying earlier it's human nature most people they do quit most people throw the towel in they don't bother and why don't you make yourself in the five percent that do stick with stuff that are dogged that don't focus on the on the uh, obstacles but focus on the outcome what the actual goal is and the rest will be history okay now um Say yes. Say yes. This is a great piece of life advice. If you have opportunities, if someone suggests something to you that's new or a bit different, that maybe you're not even that keen on or you're not sure if you'll be any good at it or if you'll enjoy it, say yes anyway. Just say yes. Say yes are two words that will change your life. And the reason why is because they will expose you to new experiences. You'll learn something about yourself. You'll learn a new thing. It's life experience. It's more miles on the clock. It's an adventure. You've got no idea what your potential is and the different skills that you've got that are untapped. Your potential is limitless. So if you go around life saying yes, then you're exposing yourself to those wonderful opportunities. Yes, by saying yes, a lot of yeses in that sentence, um, there will be times when you'll say yes to something and it will be a disaster because it really wasn't a thing that you should have done. Or you weren't suited to it, but you don't know till you try. But what about you say yes to something and then great things happen as a result and it becomes a huge passion, a huge hobby. OK, so recently I said yes to windsurfing, which is very, very hard. And I was terrible at it, but I'm really glad that I did it because it was the most wonderful. It was a three day trip to Cornwall. And every day I was climbing on this board. I kept falling off it. I had real trouble standing, but it was great exercise. It was refreshing being in the sea for several hours a day. Uh, great for my fitness. And let me tell you that that first beer at the end of the day in the lovely warm hotel and that meal after a day of windsurfing in the sea with those harsh conditions and the waves and the tiredness and the exhaustion and shivering cold and the wet wetsuit because wetsuits don't work. What the hell is the point of wetsuits? I was soaking after about one minute. Um, but it's uh, it was it was great. So essentially, you know, my, my family are, are kind of my sons are into the windsurfing. They're obviously incredible at it and they look like something out of the old spice advert when they do it. Um, they said, Dad, do you want to come along? We'll do a windsurfing thing. And I just, it's not something I would voluntarily do. It's not something that if I was on my own, I would uh, sign up for. But they wanted to do it. Would I go with them? I just said yes. Even though, I mean, basically, I didn't want to. I don't want to go windsurfing. I'm not interested. I don't think it'll be my thing. I don't need to do it. But I did it. I just said, yeah, OK, I'll, I'll do something I don't want to do. I think doing things you don't want to do is is underrated. I mean, look, look, you know, if, if it's a true sort of hatred of something, you know, and if it's a case of, uh, you know, do you want to go on holiday to war torn Libya? Right. I don't want to do that, but I'll do it anyway. No, maybe not. You know, but it, it's just um, 
it, it's it's things that you wouldn't instinctively do, but just keep an open mind and make it a policy to try to say yes. Um, the opera is, again, not something that is really my bag. OK, I've never been really interested in opera. I do like classical music and I do like to listen to a bit of opera sometimes via my music streaming service. But I don't know if you know about this, but a lot of operas are four hours long. What? And my lovely wife, this was a few years ago in Austria, she said, oh, I think I might be able to get tickets for the opera, the opera in town in Salzburg. Do you want to go? Now, I, I basically don't want to go to the opera. OK, it's, it's not a genre of music that interests me. And I certainly don't fancy sitting in a theatre for four or five hours. But what did I do? I just said yes. I said, yeah, OK, let's, let's go. Let's, I said, yes, let's do that thing that I don't want to do. That's exactly what I did. I said yes to something that I didn't want to do. But I knew it wouldn't kill me. And who knows what the hell will happen. So um, we went to the opera and it was very nice. Lovely venue. And you have lots of intervals, which is excellent. I'm so good at intervals. I, I am the king of the interval, let me tell you. I, I, I smash intervals. I'm really good at knowing like how to get a drink quickly and snacks and all the rest of it. And the correct moment in which to have your wee wee. I love the interval at the theatre, at the opera, you name it. So that was the first thing is um, I enjoyed the intervals. Secondly, that the music was was nice. But also an amazing thing happened. So I watched the first part and, and that was OK. And then we had a little break and then we went back in. And I fell asleep. And it was actually amazing because I fell asleep whilst at the opera, which meant that as I slept, I had this rich, beautiful, live classical music, you know, singing and violins and other instruments that I can't think of right now. What else do you get? Pianos, I suppose, maybe trumpets. I would say so. Trombone. Xylophone. Triangle. Anyway, so you've got these lovely, uh, these lovely instruments and I'm asleep, right? And I fell asleep and I must have fallen asleep for like poof, half an hour. I swear to God, I fell asleep. By the way, I, in my opinion, I think you're allowed to uh, fall asleep at a classical concert. And the reason why is because lots of these uh, classical concert people who go, the regulars, they often close their eyes to appreciate the music. They close their eyes and they, they let the music just sort of wash through them. You know, the pros. The experts, that's what they do. They very often close their eyes, their head back and they listen. Well, I had my eyes closed, except I was asleep. But I mean, I don't think you can tell the difference. So I think etiquette wise, it's OK to fall asleep in the opera as long as you don't snore. And I guess the person next to you, especially if it's um, the person that you're with, will give you a nudge if you do snore. But I didn't snore, but I, I must have fallen asleep for about half an hour. It was the most deep restorative nap I've ever had in my life. I finally woke up. I felt like I'd been transported to another universe. I had this sort of deep, deep refreshment. Why? Well, because I'm obviously at the opera and there's this beautiful music and I fell asleep and the music has featured in my dream and it's probably been like meditation or something. So then I woke up, right? And first of all, it's quite handy because I've shortened the bloody opera by half an hour by sleeping through a chunk of it. But then I've woken up and now I've got energy, right? I feel I'm refreshed and I can actually appreciate the music and I can concentrate on it and engage my brain. And then it's time for another break and another little snack and maybe a little, a little, just a, just a little, little beer, little cold beer, a little tiny little ice cold beer, just a little, you know, it's the interval and just a little, a little cold beer, a little... Or maybe an ice-cold glass of white wine. Vino bianco. Certo. Si, si, si. So a little, uh, a little, you know, a little, a little snack. Mm, yes, please. And then you're back in. You're back in for part seven. And I came out of this opera having enjoyed it, having slept through some of it. It was a different experience. I was out of my comfort zone. Something you're going to hear a lot about in this show is the importance of exiting your comfort zone because it's good for us. Again, right. Something I'll always talk about is that we're, we're pushing back on 
what we naturally want to do. Okay, so we're naturally lazy. We naturally avoid risk. We're naturally conservative and with a small C, careful and cautious. And uh, we, we cut corners. You know, that's the sort of the, the human blueprint. So this show will will try to push back on that because the people that do push back on those natural instincts to be a bit lazy, conserve energy, take the easy route, the low-hanging fruit, uh, the people that push back on that are the ones who do have more productive and more fulfilled lives. That's the thing. It's like earlier in a previous show, I talked about working out what your torture is, your preferred form of torture, and really, really bond with that. You know, what is what is the form of torture that you find acceptable? And then use that to get yourself from A to B. So honestly, I promise you, take my word for it. Uh, most people are lazy. They go for the easy route. They follow the crowd. They stick with convention, the status quo, the received wisdom. And the 5%, which is you and me, Okay, and by the way, if you're in the 90, 95% with this podcast, I'm dragging you into the 5%. It's that you can be one of the 95 percenters, but it's never too late to cross the Rubicon into becoming the hero. And that's what this show is all about. So, so therefore, um, comfort zone, yeah, you know, discomfort, doing things that you wouldn't normally do, saying yes to things that you don't want to do, come out of your comfort zone have discomfort every day make discomfort your best friend and you'll find it incredibly joyful let's move on to a great travel tip don't fly direct so direct flights are more convenient they're quicker if it's a short holiday then you've got no choice if you're away for three days what are you going to do but if you've got a longer period of time if you go for an indirect flight you're going to save money and if you wind up stopping off somewhere like madrid or hong kong uh, if there's time, you can hop off the plane. And don't forget, if it's a if it's a, a non-direct flight, your bags will automatically go on to the next plane. So you haven't got to worry about the bags. So you're just going to be with your hand luggage only. So let's imagine you've got to stop off at Madrid. And let's say you arrive at Madrid mid-morning. Well, then that's lovely, right? You go out of the airport, you jump into a cab, or you jump onto a bus or the train and you get yourself into the city centre of Madrid and you have lunch with tapas, with uh, prawns, pil pil, patatas bravas, maybe even a little, a little sangria or a CCC San Miguel. Just have a little, a little, a little CCC San Miguel. And uh, imagine that. So you're on your way to some other destination okay and i don't know if let's say it's turkey let's say you're on your way to turkey you've gone from you're flying from london to turkey and you've had a stop off at madrid and that's amazing because that's just a free trip to madrid you've saved money because it's a cheaper flight because it's not direct and you've popped into madrid you've had your patatas bravas and a, and a ccc san miguel um, you've walked around. Maybe there's time for a quick museum, uh, maybe some shopping in the late afternoon and then back to the airport, back on the plane and off you go to Turkey. So it's a fabulous thing. Don't fly direct. Let me talk to you about two more things before we go. First of all, my products of the week uh, here in the UK, we have a product called Dash Water. Sparkling water infused with wonky peaches. Okay, it's called Dash Water. Um, the ingredients are carbonated spring water, natural flavorings, peach extract, and malic acid, which gives it a little bite, but completely natural. So there's nothing unnatural in this product, and it contains zero calories. Now, the reason why I've mentioned Dash Water is because um, this show is global and we are listened to and watched all over the world. It's unlikely that Dash is available in all territories. But the good news is that this is increasingly now a new genre of drink. So wherever you're based, there will be an equivalent 
of Dash. And what it is, is infused spring water. It's important always to read the ingredients. You don't want sugar in there. You don't want preservatives. You don't want uh, saccharin or, or any of those artificial sweeteners. Um, it's got to be, and the genre it needs a name really, doesn't it? But I suppose it's flavoured water or infused water. But essentially, when you have these things, you're essentially drinking fizzy water. But because it's just got the the essence of a fruit, for example, black currants or blood orange or uh, in this case, peaches, it just it just it, it's always perfume. It just just gives it enough flavor, enough taste to make it more drinkable than regular water. Um, do you find drinking water a bit of an effort, a bit of a drag? Some people don't like the taste of water. So try one of these infused fizzy waters. I think they're absolutely brilliant. They say zero calories, no tooth decay. You're not putting on any weight. And, and I'm a really big fan of them. So uh, look out for that kind of product in your local supermarket or health food shop. Particularly useful if you don't feel like you get enough fluids. I mean, this here is 330 mil. So... If you drank a couple of those a day, you're good to go. You've done your hydration and you've done it in a fun, enjoyable way. Obviously, don't get me wrong. Nothing wrong with water. Water is probably the perfect drink, but we're just being realistic. Also, the other thing I would say to you, by the way, because I, I you know, we most people like soft drinks. They're not good for you, but they're, they're sort of obviously enjoyable and they're full of sugar and they're very bad for you. So you must never have them. But why are they so alluring? And I think a big part of the attractiveness of soft drinks is the carbonation. It's the bubbles. So when you take, I don't know, just a regular fizzy mineral water like a Perrier or a Badois or a Highland Spring, or if you go for one of these infused sparkling waters, I think you're halfway there to the enjoyment of a soft drink. I certainly find when I have these, even if it is just a straight fizzy mineral water, that just that kind of bite on the back of the throat, you know, the, the way that the way that the, the, the bubbles really sort of they cut, they cut the palate, don't they? There's that little burn almost from a sparkling water, especially if it's been chilled. I think it's a great thing. And um, I, I sort of feel like my subconscious thinks that it's had a soft drink, even though it's not. And it's because of the bubbles. So I think a big attraction of, of soft drinks is the bubbles and you're cutting out the middleman by having one that's got no horrible ingredients. So that's uh, highly recommended. And then let's have a look. How are we doing for time? OK, I think I'm going to treat you to this because this is very good. Absolutely amazing product that you need to have in your life. And it is erythritol. Now, what is erythritol? That sounds very scientific. Well, it's completely natural. It's a natural sweetener which comes from fermented fruit. In the UK, it's branded as Truvia. But um, again, around the world, there'll be different permutations of it. But what you're looking for is erythritol. And the reason why I like it is because it has the same sweetness as sugar. So if you like to have a teaspoon of sugar in your tea in the morning or your coffee. If you have a teaspoon of erythritol, you'll get the same sweetness. So it's 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 like for like with regular sugar. It looks like regular sugar. It's granulated. You can get it in cubes as well, but it, I just have the regular granulated type. It's fabulous for baking. It's fabulous, as I say, in, in your drink. You can make lemonade with it without having to use sugar, things like that. It's fabulous erythritol and it's completely natural. And in fact, the body produces erythritol. So it's a marvellous thing. Let me tell you, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a nutritionist. So anything I say is just my own experience. I'm not an expert. And if you're concerned about it, look it up and check with your doctor or your nutritionist. But for me, erythritol is great. Why is it great? Well, zero calories. Uh, zero carbohydrates. So when you have erythritol, you're getting the sweetness, but you don't spike your insulin, which is linked to fat storage and becoming a porker. So erythritols uh, essentially just you don't digest it. It passes through you. Um, the alternative is another sweetener called xylitol, and that's a sugar alcohol, again, derived from fruits and vegetables. Very, very popular. 
my issue with xylitol is it's got a slightly cold taste to it, almost a bit like mint or something. So it can feel a, a little odd in the mouth. And also some people, and, and I must say I've been guilty of this, that um, they, they can have an effect on the digestion. In other words, you, it makes you want to poo very quickly. So it can have a slightly, um, what's the word? The diuretic makes you wee, doesn't it? But it's the, it's the poo equivalent of the diuretic effect. Laxative, there you go. It'll, it'll have a laxative effect if you have too much. So not everyone um, agrees with or gets on with xylitol, but I will say, again, it's completely natural. And by the way, hilariously, if you've got any, if you've got, uh, if you've got, constipation actually xylitol is is a natural laxative so that's not bad again i'm not a doctor consult your physician but um it's worked for me but um but so my preference is erythritol because it, there's no digestive stuff there um certainly for me or anyone i've known um so it's without side effects and it's completely natural it's a little bit more expensive than sugar for which i apologize but you're not going to get tooth decay. You're not going to get fats. You're not going to get the energy crash because, you know, that's what happens when you have sugar. I love erythritol. Give it a go. At work, I bought in a tub of erythritol because um, I wanted to have um, the occasional cup of coffee, but nice and sweet. And so I just left it next to the work kettle in the kitchen, assuming it wouldn't be touched by anyone else because who wants to have my weird potion? OK, because people are pretty conventional. They're like people are like sugar. They like sugar. I've tried to encourage people to have erythritol. They're like, oh, what is that? Thanks, but no thanks. I've, I've noticed resistance to it. Um, so I had it just, uh, in the office. Let me tell you, within a week, the bloody thing was empty and everyone had had it. Now, this tells me two things. One, that there is an appetite out there. People want an alternative to sugar. And the second second thing it tells me is that people tried it, liked it and had more of it. So why don't you do the erythritol test? I love it. Um, in a future show, we'll talk about stevia, which is a different kind of sweetener and with a different role. And it's brilliant, too. But for just regular sugar replacement, try erythritol. I cannot tell you how much I love it. It's outstanding. Um, in fact, if you just were, if you, if you like were craving sugar, let's say you were sugar free, but you were craving something sweet, you could literally just take a teaspoon of erythritol and just shake it onto your tongue and eat it and all would be good with the world. Um, I should tell you this story briefly about my lovely, excellent dentist. So I, I, I stopped eating sugar in June 2018. I think it was. Yeah, that's a long time ago, isn't it? That's ages ago. And I did it because I decided to go low carb and sugar is a carbohydrate. It's a pure carbohydrate. So I went low carb. I stopped having bread, pasta, rice and all sugar. And it was interesting because I decided in terms of my family, I was not going to lecture them. I wasn't going to tell them that they shouldn't have sugar because that's only going to backfire, isn't it? You tell your kids to do one thing, they'll do the opposite. So I deployed clever psychology and I just said, look, I'm going low carb. I'm not going to bother you guys with it. I just eat my own weird meals. We'll, we'll, we'll be around the table, but I won't be having the pasta and, and you will. And I was just quite private about it, which, by the way, I think is a good thing anyway. Whatever journey you're on, you don't have to force other people to go on it with you. Um, but what happened because of that approach is that they were curious. My kids were curious, going, oh, why aren't you having sugar? And where's your pasta? And I explained it all. And uh, certainly my youngest, but both of them really, and, and my wife, but, um, but, but the youngest in particular, he, he was very interested in this uh, not having sugar thing. And he just started to have less sugar. OK, Compl I promise you, it's not brainwashing, because as far as I'm concerned, they're kids. And I thought, I, first of all, kids can, you know, if they're healthy and if they're active, they can they can handle sugar. No problem. They can process it. They can burn it off. So I did not have an agenda. Um, you know, my mom. Her, she was a bit pre-diabetic, so I, I wanted her to not have sugar because that was to do with her not developing type 2 diabetes. She did cut her sugar down and she effectively put it into remission. So I probably, you know, being honest, I would I did have a, a, an agenda maybe with my mum, although, you know, she she actually initiated it. So that wasn't a problem. But with my kids, I'm not going to tell them. I'm not going to deprive them of sugar. But my youngest, he just was curious and then he just decided he was going to eat a bit less sugar. It just was a thing. 
And I remember he went to a he went to a German class because he was learning German at the time and brilliant German teacher would reward. They'd be in a class and whoever got the most points that week would get a prize. And it was a chocolate bar. So I was waiting in the car. He comes out from this lesson. He jumps into the car. I said, how was the lesson? He said, it was great. He said, and I got this Cadbury's twirl, I think it was, which is a chocolate bar because he got the highest points. Oh, well done you. Um, and he said, can I have an hour? And I said, yeah, yeah, you're not having dinner for a couple of hours. Go for it. So he opened it. He took a bite and said, that is disgusting. And I said, really? And he said, yeah. He said, try it. You try it. And I tasted it. It was so sickly sweet. I'm like, yeah, that's not nice. And the reason why is because he had cut his sugar consumption by choice. And therefore, he's re-educated his palate back to original factory settings, if you like. So that when it goes in the mouth, you realize this isn't good. This is a toxin because sugar is a toxin, by the way. And so by having less sugar, it's actually put him off sugar so that he can't like enjoy sugar so much, which is remarkable. So he's basically just we actually chucked the chocolate bar. I'm like, he's like, do you mind if I throw this away? I'm like, you go for it, whatever you want, you know. So this was a few months where uh, he he uh, compared certainly, you know, he, he'd have the odd bit of sugar, but compared to his mates, a fraction of what his mates at school were having. And in fact, he went to a birthday party and one of the lovely mums at the birthday party said, Peter, why aren't you eating sugar? And she was almost telling him off for it. Um, anyway, that was his thing. So guess what happened? Um we went to the dentist and you, I think for a kid, it's every six months. So six months had passed and we went to the dentist and it was just for our usual checkup. And the dentist looked in my son's mouth and said, have you stopped eating sugar? And I couldn't believe it. My son said, yes, I, I've, I've cut back. I don't eat as much sugar. The dentist saw it straight away. Now, this is two things. First of all, it shows you what a good dentist this is, that, that this guy spotted the difference in the mouth. But also the miracle of not eating sugar. I mean, yes, you you know, you're thinking about your, your, your weight, your waistline. You want to lose a bit of weight. Sugar is absolutely your first port of call. But dental health as well is something that people gloss over. So if, you, if you're if you just having erythritol rather than sugar, you've got no impact on your dental health. Just think how good that would be for the world. No fillings, no dental caries. But my son, after a few months of no sugar, it was spotted, unprovoked by the dentist. Remarkable stuff. Um, look, I think we're uh, we're almost there. It's been lovely chatting to you. And I can't wait for the next episode already. We've we were getting um, getting some very strong ideas together for that as we speak. You can hear this show on every podcast platform. You can watch it uninterrupted on YouTube as well. So that's pretty marvellous, isn't it? Um, let me leave you with one last beautiful thing. And it is, have I written it down? Yes, I have. Help is there, so take it. In life, whatever you're going through, work problems, financial issues, mental health, physical health, stuff that you just can't fix, relationship issues, whatever you're going through, help is out there, so take it. You've got books, you've got the internet, you've got chat rooms, you've got social media groups, you've got podcasts, Whatever you're going through, help is out there. So take it. The best way to do that is to be honest with yourself and go, I've got an issue. I've got a problem. Right. So truth to yourself. And once you've acknowledged it. So I don't know, I'll just pluck something out of thin air. Let's just say that um, you're having you're drinking too much. OK. And it's an issue. Oh, I don't know if I'm an alcoholic or something, but I'm just drinking more than I would like to drink. And it's affecting my life. Help is out there. But what you've got to do is you've got to be honest with yourself, you acknowledge it, and then you get on the internet and you Google, am I drinking too much? You, you go on uh, the, the podcast platform and just keyword search alcohol and then bang, a million podcasts will come up. And what will be in those podcasts? Well, other people talking about alcohol and sharing. 
So help is out there. Um, and it's so many, you know, it's resources. It, it could be a friend, it could be someone in the office that you talk to. Um, a friend of mine was addicted to smoking and couldn't stop smoking and kept trying willpower method, you know, and lasted a couple of days and then bang, smoking again. And this person was in a secondhand bookshop and they just spotted the easy way to stop smoking by Alan Carr. So they bought it and they read it and they never smoked again. But the reason why that worked is, is because this person acknowledged that they were smoking and wanted to stop. And therefore their eyes were peeled. They were open to help. They were ready. They were receptive. And it's almost like a psychic thing. They've gone to this bookshop. They've spotted a book that would really help. And they've bought that book. The number of people who would need help in any department, and we all do at all times, but the number of people that uh, need help but don't accept it is absolutely astonishing. So there'll be people that want to give up smoking and they'll be in a bookshop and there'll be a book saying how to not smoke and, and they won't buy the book. It's like you don't want to smoke. You're in a bookshop. There's a book which says we'll get you off the fags and you don't even pick it up and, and read the back of the book for some more information. It's astonishing how and, and we've all done it. You know, you've done it. I've done it. You will do it. You, I will do it. But where we just like to sort of be in our bubble and struggle on and not accept help and even turn our back on help. It's like, no, help is there. So take it. Embrace it. You're in trouble. You're smoking too much. There's a book which tells you how not to smoke. Buy the bloody book. Don't walk on by. But that's what people do. I'll give you a good example. Neighbor, lovely guy, big fan of his. And he's in middle age. And he's 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 a bit chunky. I can't lie. He's a he's a big old unit. He's overweight. Yes, he is. And I am, as you know, very passionate about this low carbohydrate thing, because I believe that you just your body mass index just shrinks when you cut the carbs. You just get thin. You're never hungry. I think it's super healthy because it's based on real food like fish, meat, uh, eggs and natural fats and green fibrous vegetables. And there's no processed junk. That's why you get thin. Anyway, so this guy is um, talking about how he wants to lose a bit of weight and he's worried about his heart and all that. And I said, oh, well, actually, I've done quite a lot of work on this and um, I'm, I'm really into low carb. If you if you want, I can we can have a, a coffee sometime and I'll talk you through it. And he went, no, 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 I don't, I don't want to do that. You know, I've got my own plan and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And he literally panicked at the idea of me helping him. And I accepted that. Of course I did. You know me. I'm not pushy in that way. It's like I'm not forcing this on anyone. Absolutely not. But the guy's overweight. I promise you I could I can get him thin. I really can. And I've done it with others, which we'll talk about in a future show. But he was so resistant to the idea of help and the guy would need a bit of help. He is overweight and his um, medical checkups, you know, didn't read well with his cholesterol and all the rest of it. Right. So this guy is, I mean, I don't want to say it, but maybe a heart to take heart attack waiting to happen. But he, he pushed back and he didn't want to be helped. And he looks the same now as he did when we had that conversation, which was about four years ago. And just imagine he could be four years now being fit and lean and healthy, but that's it. It's a free world. It's a free country. I'm not an autocrat each to their own. But I think don't fall into that trap. It's a bit like earlier when we were talking in the show about say yes to stuff. Um, be open, be receptive to help and understand that the resources are there. So just tap into them. And it's a spectacular thing. If it's, if it's alcohol, for example, and you're struggling a bit, if you listen to a podcast about alcohol, that will already help because There'll be people talking about alcohol and, and they'll say, oh, well, here's the problem with it. And here's how I managed to reduce my drinking or stop it or whatever. And and you just immediately it will immediately be better than where you are at the moment. And the help is there and you just tapped into it. <clears throat> that brings us to the end of the show. There's so many things I could talk to you about, but I'll save it for next time. Um, really enjoyed your company, as I say. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel and also via your podcast provider, you can subscribe to this show so that you automatically download the new episode every week. Wouldn't that be nice? Um, have a great few days and I'll see you next time.
Thanks for listening. Excuse me, put my teeth in. Thanks for listening and or watching. Bye bye. <laughs>